For all its beauty and splendor, the wilderness can be a cruel teacher. The mountains are beautiful, but they don't care if you live or die. They are raw and unforgiving, beautiful but brutal and don't wait for anyone. A rock slide can come down in a heartbeat, tearing through the silence and turning the world into dust and shattered stone. You have to know this if you go into the high country. You must understand that each step could be your last, and that nature won't give you a second chance. Let's venture back to the savage wilderness, where survival is earned, not given. This is Outdoor Disasters. For Kevin DePaolo, his mountain adventure would be unforgettable. Kevin DePaolo arrived in Bishop, California in early December 2023. Kevin is a New York native who loves mountains. After three years on the road, living out of his van, he'd come to see his climbing mentor, Joshua Nelson, and rest in the high desert. He'd been climbing peaks up north, from Washington to Alaska, and Bishop felt like a good place to settle back into the land. Bishop sat out in Owens Valley, dusty and quiet, between the Sierra Nevada and the Inyo Mountains. It was a place made for men who liked the earth, rock climbers, hikers, mountain folk. Mount Whitney rose to the west, the highest point in the lower 48, and beyond lay the route for Pacific Crest Trail hikers. The valley floor was scattered with boulders as big as houses, thrown down ages ago from the mountains. Climbers and off-roaders played there, testing themselves on the ancient granite. On December 5, 2023, DePaolo and Nelson met early. Neither of them felt up for anything too hard that day. De Paolo had just summited the 13,658-foot or 4,162-meter Mount Tom, and Nelson was worn out, fighting an illness and some back pain. They decided to hunt for stones instead. The mountains held deposits of quartz, garnet, obsidian, old prospects from when men came here to search for fortune. Rock hounding had become a hobby for locals, a calm thing to do if you had patience and could walk the miles. It's good for the mind going out and hunting rocks, DePaolo said. They picked a spot 90 minutes southeast in the Inyo Mountains, a barren place with standing stones. Nelson picked up DePaolo in his SUV, and they loaded up the tools, pickaxes, shovels, chisels, pry bars, and rock hammers. They drove down a dirt road winding up to the base of a high ridge. They parked there, dividing about 70 pounds of gear between them. Each had water, some food, and a phone. Nelson had extra food, fresh batteries, and warm clothes in case the day ran long. At 10.30 a.m., they shouldered their packs and started up a slope of loose scree. No trail to follow. Just sagebrush and open sky. It was cool and quiet, the air still. They saw no other cars, no people. It's the most beautiful day, Nelson said. They scrambled up through a couple of gullies and onto a stretch dotted with boulders some the size of refrigerators. They stopped, took off their packs, and began looking for minerals in the dirt. After a while, they uncovered a seam of quartz, following it down to two giant boulders wedged in the slope. DePaolo got down on his hands and knees, digging around the base of one of the rocks, eyes fixed on the mud. Then he sat up, and the rock shifted, a slow lean forward. Kev, look out! Nelson shouted. But it was too late. The boulder rolled, crashing into DePaolo, pinning his leg and pelvis under its weight. It felt like a bus hit me, like it just drove into me and tore me apart, Kevin recalled. Pain hit him in waves as he lay pinned, bleeding, and broken under the five-ton rock on the mountainside. What was supposed to be a relaxing day of mineral hunting with a friend in the rugged backcountry became a nightmarish fight for survival. Nelson heard his friend scream and rushed down, both of DePaolo's legs were trapped beneath the huge rock, crushing him at the groin. Nelson jammed an axe handle under the boulder to keep it from rolling farther onto DePaolo's chest. Then he crouched down, gripped the underside, and strained to lift. Somehow, he got the boulder up just enough for DePaolo to pull his left leg free. The leg came out bruised, split open at the groin, dark with blood and crushed muscle. Nelson saw bone, muscle fibers and tendons, but DePaolo's right leg was still pinned under the rock. Right then, I knew it was bad. We weren't hiking out of there, Nelson said. 
He tied a shirt around DePaolo's leg to slow the bleeding, then grabbed his phone and dialed 911. DePaolo's screams tore through the thin mountain air. The call reached the Inyo County Sheriff's Office a little after 3 p.m. The dispatcher raised the local search and rescue team, a crew of about 60 volunteers, all seasoned in the wild. There were doctors, teachers, and even an Aussie mechanic known for pulling stuck vehicles off rocky trails. Most of them were hardened climbers trained in wilderness medicine, rope access, and high angle rescue. They were one of the busiest SAR teams in California, handling as many as 100 missions a year, mostly pulling injured climbers off Mount Whitney. As they mobilized, the sheriff's office called the California Highway Patrol in Fresno for a helicopter. The plan was to fly in two medics to assess DePaolo's injuries, while two more rescuers drove around to the mountain's backside to reach him on foot. By the time the helicopter landed outside town, the sun had sunk behind the Sierra Crest, taking the last of the day's warmth. Nelson had cut away DePaolo's cargo pants and wrapped his torn leg with puffy jackets, but the cold was setting in, and DePaolo started shivering hard. Nelson built a small fire, feeding it sagebrush to keep his friend warm. DePaolo stayed conscious, drifting between calm and panicked bursts of fear. Nelson saw the pain was intense, but he noticed no blood pooling around DePaolo's lower body, a sign he took that his friend wasn't in immediate danger of bleeding out. At one point, DePaolo, overcome with fear, looked up at his friend and pleaded, please call my mom, I need to tell her I'm going to die up here. Nelson paused, then shook his head. I understood, but I felt that calling his mom would only shake him more. This was survival, and he needed to stay calm. Nelson looked to Paolo in the eyes and said, You don't need to say your goodbyes, because you're going to live. By the time Nelson saw the headlamp cutting down the slope toward him, De Paolo had been trapped under the boulder for five hours. It was just after 7 p.m. The first searchers to reach them were the two men who'd hiked over in the dark from the mountain's backside. Tim Kay, an Aussie mechanic, and Matt, an engineer who knew his way around ropes. They'd brought an unusual tool, a high-lift jack, a two-foot steel ratchet built for lifting heavy things. The jack weighed 30 pounds and looked like the barrel of a machine gun with an extended hand lever that moved a claw up a notched steel shaft. It could lift up to 5,000 pounds inch by inch. Tim had used it before to free jeeps and rock crawlers around Bishop and even to move boulders on rough trails. When the SAR call came, Tim grabbed the jack and headed out. We didn't know what we'd find, but I figured it was something a jack might handle, he said. Soon, two more search and rescue members arrived, dropped by a CHP helicopter on a ridge above. One. Isaac snapped on latex gloves and checked De Paolo's injuries. The other Dan, a school teacher, unzipped a bag with a cordless hammer drill, steel anchors, pulleys, and a length of thick static rope. Tim, Matt, and Dan studied the scene working out the angles. They guessed the boulder weighed between 6,000 and 10,000 pounds and was resting on a steep slope. They decided to rig a rope system to help the jack create enough force to lift the rock off De Paolo's legs. We looked at each other's gear and figured this might just work, Tim said. Dan took the drill and anchored two bolts into the boulder, one near DePaolo's torso, the other at the top. Tim positioned the jack in the dirt close to DePaolo, clipping it to the lower bolt. Then he leaned in to begin the lifting, one inch at a time. Dan and Matt moved across the slope to a huge granite slab about 30 feet away and drilled in a new bolt. They ran a rope from the top bolt on DePaolo's boulder to the anchor rock setting up pulleys and a knot to multiply their strength. The rig was ready. Tim would crank the jack while Dan and Matt hauled on the rope to drag the boulder sideways onto a bed of melon-sized rocks they'd stacked next to DePaolo. By 8.10, Nelson and Isaac were crouched beside DePaolo, each gripping an armpit set to pull him free. You ready to load up? Tim called. Tension on the rope, Dan yelled back. Tim clicked the jack up one notch. Dan and Matt strained but DePaolo's leg was still pinned. A second notch, no movement. On the third click, the rock shifted and they pulled DePaolo free, laying him on the dirt. He screamed, pain tearing through him as Isaac bent down to assess the injury. 
All I wanted was to get out from under that boulder, Kevin remembered. But the second they pulled me clear, the pain hit hard. More search and rescue members made their way in, carrying supplies, sleeping bags, snacks, hot tea, to keep DePaolo comfortable. They dressed his wounds, gave him Tylenol, and secured him onto a field litter. But as he lay on the ground, still screaming, there was no clear plan to get him off the mountain. The CHP helicopter wasn't cleared for a night extraction, and word from the valley below was grim. DePaolo might have to wait until morning, a long, cold stretch given his injuries. An urgent call from the sheriff's office went through the state and reached the U.S. Navy's air station in Lemoore. By 9.30 p.m., a four-man crew loaded into a Seahawk helicopter and flew east over the Sierra. This crew was trained for night hoists, but the mission was difficult. They'd drop a crewman at the site, pull back, let him load DePaolo onto a steel litter, and then return to lift them both out. The helicopter would have to come in close, within 30 feet or 9 meters of the rock-strewn slope, leaving little margin for error. The rotor blades had to clear the steep mountain face, and there was a risk that the rotors might kick up loose soil and rocks, blinding the ground crew or hitting DePaolo with flying debris. We knew if we strayed we could push the survivors or the team over the edge, said Navy Lieutenant. Shagor Paul, the mission commander. We had to be right on the mark, added Lieutenant. William Zell, the co-pilot. As they crossed the dark valley, the pilots spotted the SAR team's headlamps from five miles out. When the chopper drew near, the ground crew doused the fire, slipped sunglasses over DePaolo's eyes, and backed up the slope, watching as the Seahawk hovered close above. The helicopter arrived with a roar, blinding lights cutting through the darkness, whipping air and dirt as it hovered above DePaolo. A crewman dropped down and landed beside him, checking his vitals and loading him into a steel litter as the chopper lifted away. The flight to Fresno took 45 minutes. They wheeled me into the hospital, all those bright lights, just like in the movies. It shocks you. Before I knew it, I was on an ER table with 10 people pulling at me, Kevin recalled. The diagnosis was grim but straightforward. His pelvis had fractured in several places, and his left leg had a severed femoral artery. He'd need emergency surgery right away, but Kevin had been lucky. Despite the fractures, his right leg, the one crushed by the boulder, had somehow avoided any breaks, though it was badly bruised. Even more astounding, though his femoral artery was severed, he hadn't bled out, something that should have happened within minutes. Just before surgery, Kevin finally called his mom, reassuring her he was okay. The doctors worked quickly to save his leg. A few days later, one of the doctors came to check on him and admitted he managed to save his leg. I broke down in tears. I didn't even really know how to react to it emotionally. I couldn't even believe it. I was extremely thankful. Kevin said. Kevin went through weeks of brutal physical therapy but slowly, he learned to stand on his own two feet again. When he finally walked out of the hospital, he looked much the same, though inside, everything had changed. The close brush with death had shifted something profound in him. Josh Nelson, whose quick thinking had kept Kevin alive in those first critical moments, couldn't see him immediately but made plans to meet up soon. Kevin had been at a crossroads before the accident, and now he felt it even more. A few months after his harrowing ordeal, Kevin reunited with the Navy helicopter crew who had saved his life. Lieutenant William Zell, HM2 Matthew Rector, and AWS2 Jonathan Sponsler. The atmosphere in the room was filled with both gratitude and relief as Kevin finally had the chance to thank the team who had brought him to safety. As he entered, Kevin's face broke into a smile, though the emotion was clear in his eyes. He moved forward, shaking each of their hands. His words were genuine and heartfelt as he looked each of them in the eye, expressing the depth of his appreciation. Thank you guys so much for everything. I wouldn't be standing or walking if it wasn't for you guys. I can't put into words how thankful I am, Kevin expressed. The team responded humbly, nodding as Kevin shared how their rescue had changed his life. For them, it was part of the job, but for Kevin, it was a profound and life-altering moment. He insisted on telling them how he'd never forget the hand gesture one of the crew made, ensuring him everything would be okay. It was a life-changing experience. 
I think about these guys every day of my life, Kevin said. The experience gave Kevin DePaolo a lot to reflect on, helping him reassess his priorities and recognize what truly mattered in life. While he still valued adventure and exploration, he realized there were more important things than the path he had been on before. Kevin would state, the search and rescue team, they don't even get paid. It's all volunteers. So they could have just been eating dinner with their family when they got the call to come out there and rescue me. I was inspired by all that. Even the doctors and nurses who do that every day just as a part of their job, no one ever really thanks them or tells them how much they're appreciated. The wilderness is a beautiful, indifferent force. It's patient, waiting with silent grace for the hiker who thinks that a leisurely day out is nothing but fresh air and calm trails. Yet the mountains have a way of showing you their teeth when you least expect it. One minute the sky is blue and the path is familiar. Out here, there are no certainties, no easy days. The earth shifts, the temperature drops, and the distance you thought you could handle stretches out beyond the edge of your endurance. In the wilderness, one misplaced step or missed sign can change everything. Out here, nature doesn't forgive. And then, when hope has grown thin, when a person finds themselves in a precarious situation, the call goes out. That's when they come. Those search and rescue souls. Men and women who answer the call in the dead of night with no thought for themselves. They lace their boots, strap on packs heavier than their own weight in grit, and plunge into the unknown. They walk into the heart of danger because saving lives is in their blood. This is their calling, their reason. They are driven not by glory but by a deep-seated purpose. They are the ones who will cross rivers, climb cliffs, and face storms so that a stranger might live to see another dawn. They are unsung heroes, and the world is a better place because they are in it. They are hands that lift the fallen and carry the injured out of an outdoor disaster. If you've made it this far, please consider clicking those subscribe and like buttons. Want more outdoor disasters content? Check out these videos I believe you'll enjoy. Thank you for watching.